set about re-recording Roald Dahl's works on audio by combining the cream of the acting world, the film industry, the sound and music to create some really dazzling, immersive new audio books. I've always loved words and performance and it only took me 45 years to put the two of them together and say audiobook production. Uh, I studied English literature at university and then I um, spent 10 years making absolutely no impact on the acting profession and then I ended up working in radio, it's a long story, it involves dressing as a frog, and got to do a lot of production there of all kinds of things, came back to the UK and started doing freelance work as an audiobook producer and then ended up Penguin. Folly is the, it's the replacement or the remaking of sounds for films and television or audiobooks or, or radio. Basically, if you can imagine a film set, there are so many different things happening not everything gets recorded on the day, or certain things like CGI that we might be brought into a film won't have its own sound. So we create extra sounds to be laid on top of an existing soundtrack. Uh, I've, I first learned about Foley and became a Foley artist whilst I was working for a, a dubbing theatre, a, a sound house. Um, I used to record Foley artists working and realised that I'd much prefer to be doing what they were doing than, than being a technician. I got into Foley through studying uh, multimedia technology and music at university um, and just wanted to get involved in as many different aspects of that as possible. I heard about the job at Pinewood as a runner. Most people at Pinewood start as runners, which is a really nice thing because then you sort of work up into the direction that you want to choose to go into. When I was young, I used to mess around. My mum and dad, were, I was lucky enough to play around with their video camera and stuff, so my brother and I used to make silly videos and things and try and make sound effects and put them on them for our action figures and things. And then I went into DJing whilst being at university always thought I wanted to work in picture until I realised you could do a job as fun as this and get paid for it. And this business of taking the whole book and being responsible for every word in it and making that flow, making it come alive, but not overdoing it because you are after all right in someone's head and managing the characters and the voice and the tone of the whole thing. It's really, it's a very demanding skill and you are faced with, you know, you are staring at white paper with reams of text on it for six or seven hours a day. In terms of the characters, there, is, there are some great characters throughout the book and you know particularly the dad is, is he's the main character and uh, so I, I, I ended up giving him a sort of, I ended up giving him a, a sort of sort of soft northern accent. A petrol engine is sheer magic, he said to me once. Just imagine being able to take a thousand different bits of metal and if you fit them all together in a certain way and then if you feed them a little oil and petrol and if you press a little switch suddenly those bits of metal will all come to life and they will purr and hum and roar they will make the wheels of a motor car go whizzing round at fantastic speeds the Sar sergeant samways the policeman I sort of gave him a bit of a Lionel Jeffries voice, which is really the only thing that you could, you could do with him. I'm sure he wrote that with him in mind. Well, 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 said Sergeant Samways at last, puffing out his chest and addressing nobody in particular. What, may I ask, is Eppinin around here? Kate Winslet doing uh, Matilda, the voice she got for Matilda. That was, that was just fantastic, really, really enjoyable to hear those. The Chokey, Hortensia went on, is a very tall but very narrow cupboard. The floor is only ten inches square, so you can't sit down or squat in it. You have to stand. And three of the walls are made of cement with bits of broken glass sticking out all over, so you can't lean against them. You have to stand more or less at a tension the whole time when you get locked up in there. It's terrible. Can't you lean against the door? Matilda asked. 
Uh, this is this is extraordinary, extraordinary chances to work with these people. And they were, they were, there, there were some people who read who didn't know Dahl at all, uh, and there were some who just loved him. And uh, Richard Ayoade, for example, and Peter Serafinovich, um, and Chris O'Dowd. You know, these people had a had felt a connection with Dahl when they were growing up, and for them it was a, it was it was something they clearly wanted to do, and that was very exciting too. There are s most actors who are familiar with the format actually quite like having someone who's prepared to say, oh, could we just try that again? Because quite a lot of audiobook production doesn't really do that. They just stick a person in a room, get them to record it, and there's someone checking the text. Here, because we do actually spend quite a lot of time trying to make it really good, you do interact with actors. So even really experienced actors quite enjoy the fact that you can say, do you want to just try that one more time? Or do you want to maybe make this character a bit darker? Or whatever. Um, some who aren't familiar with doing audiobooks are very glad to be kind of walked through the first steps to get used to the process. Once more the maiden's eyelid flickers, she draws the pistol from her knickers. Once more she hits the vital spot and kills him with a single shot. She cried. At once the tummy voice came through. It shouted, Hi there, listen you, I'm getting hungry. Then, one day, James's mother and father went to London to do some shopping, and there a terrible thing happened. Both of them suddenly got eaten up, in full daylight, mind you, and on a crowded street, by an enormous angry rhinoceros which had escaped from the London Zoo. Hairy faces. What a lot of hairy-faced men there are around nowadays. When a man grows hair all over his face, it is impossible to tell what he really looks like. Perhaps that's why he does it. He'd rather you didn't know. Our large trees are like your cities and towns, and the small trees are like your villages. It was an astonishing sight. Every kind of wonderful bird was flying in and perching on the branches of the great tree. Through Foley and sound design, we've attempted to bring to life the really key moments in Dahl, such as the scene in The Witches where the mice are running through the hotel kitchen and there's pots and pans clattering around them. Then he said, come on, boys, give us some gravy. He carried the plate round to everyone in the kitchen. And do you know what they did? Every one of those cooks and kitchen boys spat onto the old lady's plate. <coughs> See how she likes it now, said the cook. We've experimented with different rhythms and echoes and textures within sound and the, the result is a really immersive listening experience, something that really transports the listener into the story into a, into a different way. Okay, so this is my table of props for um, the hotel kitchen. So some of the things just to make the kitchen noises like knives and forks being dropped onto plates or pots and pans being dropped and people cooking. All those kind of sounds that we've got on this table here. So here we've got a much smaller set of props. This is for Granny. Lovely pair of Granny heels there that I wear and walk around in. Her walking stick and her handbag that contains the mouse. The lift reached the ground floor and stopped with a jerk. My grandmother walked out of it and crossed the lobby of the hotel and entered the dining room. Once we've decided on the text and got the final version of the text, uh, we then send it off to the actor and hopefully they will read it, mark it up, prepare it. Meantime, I will also have read it and prepared it and so on, so I've got notes on the characters and notes on pronunciations and decisions about, for example, in some of the Dahl books, there are things like, here is a picture of me, age nine. Sometimes you can do that and it doesn't matter, um, but if it's just like, uh, look at this, well, that's pointless on an audiobook. So you either find a way around it or you just cut it. Meanwhile, the actor will have his or her text in front of him or her. Um, they may have notes as well, or they may just have little scribbled ideas, or in some cases, literally scraps of paper that they put in front of them and refer to occasionally. Um, and between us, uh, there'll be questions like, oh, did I say that Mrs. Evans was actually going to be Welsh? Or did she originally come from Scotland? I forget, oh, whatever it happens to be. And so we'll compare notes on that and try and make sure that that is consistent. What I would normally do is, is have an image to work with so I can mimic exactly what's on the image. If it was footsteps, for instance, I follow a character on the screen and, and do the footsteps for them. But with an audio book, 
I've got somebody saying a character walks a certain place. And I can choose, as I'm listening to the story in my headphones, when to start that walk, when to stop it. And it's, it's, it's a different process because I'm listening to somebody tell me what's happening in a story as opposed to watching it and mimicking it. So it's a, a lot more fun for me. It's impulsive. And, it's, and that's testament to the writing because that kind of triggers you in the same way, in the same way I guess, with the art that you get in, within books as well. It kind of triggers you with points where you can add, but at the same time, there's points where you don't, you instantly know not to add, don't you? Yeah. Because it's the writing's done it. You don't need our our inclusion in those areas. Um, but you kind of, all of us, kind of at the same point, will know. Oh, we could do something nice for mm. this. Yeah. But it's not really an intruding on the narrator at all. The tablecloth reaches almost to the ground, so no one will see you. Have you got hold of the bottle? Yes, I whispered back. I'm ready, Grandmama. James and the Giant Peach, I really enjoyed the uh, footsteps on the peach, and they spent quite a lot of time on that one in that one place, so keeping it interesting and um, all the birds coming in and the waves and, you know, as you follow through the story, all the different characters. Um, yeah, it was, it was really exciting. In a flash... Everybody was up on top. Oh, isn't it beautiful, they cried. What a marvellous feeling. Goodbye, sharks. Ah, oh, boy, this is the way to travel. Miss Spider, who was literally squealing with excitement, grabbed the centipede by the waist and the two of them started dancing round and round the peach stem together. We've, I mean, some of the books we've actually been doing almost wild. You know, I've just mm. put the headphones on and and gone for and gone for the story, and so we've been creating sound effects quite yeah. spontaneously. Like the enormous crocodile. Like the enormous crocodile yeah. was a, a perfect example. <laughs> Luke um, was wearing bioneural microphones, and I was actually just I performed the story in a run. It was it was so exciting. It's the monkey through fun. the trees. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The water stuff and for me, I think mm. as again going back to the 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 performance thing. Some of the things that have really made me laugh and I've really enjoyed doing are the more vocal, vocal stuff like the alligator chomping through things or, mm. you know, the monkey ha 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 through trees and things like that. There was one when we were recording The Enormous Crocodile. I was doing this scene where the, the alligator's munching and crunching and crushing the children with a banana and a bit of peach and a stick of celery and a, and a, a small tangerine in my, in my hand that all eventually ended up in my mouth being crushed and, and <laughs> squished. And then I'd spat them out at the end. But I was so involved in the story and listening to it, I had I'd for completely forgotten that Luke was stood right in front of me and I spat the whole lot in his face. <laughs> Which was, I mean, and it sounded fantastic, but it was, it was a lot of fun to do. Not to spit at him, just to make the sound effect. <laughs>